Bush versus Gore, the Florida recount. Two photographers with unrestricted access. You may think you know the story, but you've never heard it from this angle. Election 2000 over time. Subscribe now wherever you get your podcasts. Good evening. It says something about the kind of week we've seen, or month, or year, or three for that matter, that the big question tonight is who are you going to believe? Someone not known for telling the truth, or someone on record having made more than 3,000 false or misleading statements since becoming president. It says even more, perhaps, that this entire deeply offensive notion also seems to be the president's entire defensive strategy tonight. As CNN was first to report, sources tell us that Michael Cohen is prepared to tell Russia's special counsel Robert Mueller that candidate Trump had advanced knowledge of the now infamous June 2016 meeting between his son, his son-in-law, and campaign chairman and Russians promising Kremlin intelligence on Hillary Clinton. In short, if Mr. Cohen is to be believed, everything that the candidate and later president, his son, the president's lawyers and spokespeople have been saying ever since has been false. And the defense, that's pretty rich. It boils down to this. Don't believe him. He's a liar. Pot, meat, kettle. I did not know of the meeting with my son, Don Jr., the president tweeted this morning. Sounds to me like someone is trying to make up stories in order to get himself out of an unrelated jam. Taxi cabs, maybe? He even retained Bill and Crooked Hillary's lawyer. Gee, I wonder if they helped him make the choice. <clears throat> no further reaction on his, on, uh, on his way to another weekend at the golf course, but the forecast is for rain, so look, there may be more tweeting this weekend. Also, no reaction from Don Jr., seen here today in what must have been a somewhat awkward moment, waiting close behind a seated Robert Mueller to board the same flight at Reagan National Airport in Washington. The two did not speak, making it the one meeting we absolutely positively know all there is to know about. No need to take anyone's word on that, especially not, say, Michael Cohen's. Here's the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, talking to CNN's Chris Cuomo about the president's former confidant. I expected something like this from Cohen. He's been lying all week. I mean, or, or for two, he's been lying for years. Lying for years, he says, which is strange because that means Michael Cohen must have been no less a liar when Rudy Giuliani was praising him for not being a liar. So was Mr. Giuliani lying in that clip you just heard or lying in this one from just a couple months ago? The man is an honest, honorable lawyer. It all becomes clear right now. It's confusing, to say the least. The honest, honorable lawyer has also been deeply dishonest for years, or at least this week. Maybe it's like truthful hyperbole or something. Or maybe, like so much else these days, it's yet another thing that would be funny if it weren't so serious. After all, this assertion by Michael Cohen, if true, casts serious doubt on the president's longtime claims of no collusion with Russia. If true, what else would be would this be except the candidate having knowledge of or complicity in a form of premeditated collaboration or attempted collaboration with a hostile foreign power in the middle of its attack on American democracy? Now, you'll remember the meeting was in June of 2016, but we didn't learn about it till the following summer. The campaign never spoke of it, nor the participants, nor the transition team, nor later the White House or the president. No one said anything until the New York Times broke the story last July. And when people did talk, the first response was to be misleading about what was discussed and to loudly make the claim that be, that's being disputed tonight that the president knew nothing about it before, after, and even a year after the fact. Did you tell your father anything about this? No. Uh, it was such a nothing. There was nothing to tell. Hey, look, here, here's what happened. Donald Trump Jr. put it all out today. It's all out. After did you know the time that they had to give no, I didn't know anything about the meeting. Let's focus on what the president was aware of. Nothing. He was not aware of the meeting. This must have been a very important, a, must have been a very unimportant meeting because I never even heard of that. I mean, I wouldn't have even remembered it until you start scouring through the stuff. It was, it was literally just a wasted 20 minutes, which was a shame. No one told you a word, nothing. I know we talked about this in claim a little bit, but nobody... No, nobody okay. told me. I didn't know anything. You know, it's you... a very unimportant, it sounded like a very unimportant meeting. The president has stated very clearly that he was not aware of the meeting, and did not attend the meeting. This is not a situation where the president was involved in this meeting, was not aware of the meeting, did not attend this meeting. When did the president learn that that meeting had taken place? Uh, I believe in the last couple of days, is my understanding. He didn't know about this meeting until a few days ago? Yes, that's correct. Mm. Yeah, he only found out a few days before. He was not aware of the meeting. He was not involved. It sounded unimportant. It was such a nothing. Okay, but keeping him honest, if, if it was such a nothing, why did everyone from the president on down start lying about it the moment it became known? Remember, first the meeting was billed as being primarily about American adoption of Russian children. That was a lie. Then came more false statements about who was actually responsible for that bogus statement. I wasn't involved in the statement drafting at all, uh, nor was the president. I'm assuming that was between Mr. Uh, Donald Trump Jr., between Don Jr. and his lawyer. So that was July 11th of last year. No presidential involvement at all. 
By early August, no involvement became some involvement. The statement that Don Jr. issued is true. There's no inaccuracy in the statement. The president weighed in as any father would based on the limited information that he had. Well, seven months later, Jay Sekulow was forced to admit in a letter to the special counsel that President Trump had, in fact, dictated what he characterized as a short but accurate statement. Not just weighed in as any dad might, but dictated it accurate or not. Now, the consensus is not. In any event, it didn't stop his colleague, Rudy Giuliani, just last month from offering up this heap and helping of word salad. I think it's a case. I mean, I obviously asked Jay about this. Uh, I think he was uninformed at the time, just like I was uh, when I came into the case. He, he was just in the case. Uh, this is a point that maybe wasn't clarified in terms of recollection and his understanding of it. And what Jay did was he, he, he immediately uh, corrected it. Uh, and even if it had been on an oath, you would call that recanting. And, and it's Jay, not the president. So that's the wisdom of not having a president testify. Uh, it's one thing to do it with a lawyer. Yeah. It's another thing to do it with, 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 with your client. So got it? Makes sense now? The president's defenders can't seem to keep their story straight about the bogus story the president concocted about the meeting that they were misleading about after concealing for a year. That's one side of the equation. On the other side, the president's turncoat attorney, who might or might not be telling the truth about his serially less than honest former client, that's where we are tonight. And so is this. Two years ago to the day, candidate Donald Trump, just a few weeks after the Trump Tower meeting, he either did or did not know in advance about, stood up and said this to the country he's now accused of colluding with. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. As we said, the president left town without answering questions about this or anything else, which does not mean there was no news at the White House today, just the opposite. Seeing as Abby Phillips joins us now, has the White House any official response to this news about the Trump Tower meeting? They have not. The White House has not offered anything in the way of clarification about many of the comments that you just played there made from the podium by the press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And the president, as you just mentioned, left town without making any statements at all, leaving this as simply his word against his former lawyers. Uh, but the president tried this morning in a tweet uh, to, to preempt questions from reporters by saying, denying the story, saying that he did not know anything about this meeting with uh, Don, Don Jr and those Russians, uh, but he does not want clearly to answer any questions from reporters about it at all, and that that is not uh, really how this works. The White House won't submit to any sort of inquiries at all from uh, White House reporters about what they make of this new reporting and how that squares with all of those past statements denying any knowledge whatsoever from the president uh, about that meeting, Anderson. Do we have any idea what the mood of the president is right now amidst all this? Well, he is clearly very angry. A White House source t told us this week that he has been stewing for days about all of this reporting, watching the coverage on television. And he's angry not just with his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, but also with reporters who continue to ask him about this at all these opportunities. They tried to change the subject this morning uh, at a pretty hastily put together press conference in the Rose Garden. Uh, the press reporters kept feet away from the president, and the president just turned and walked out of the room after. But those questions kept coming, and President Trump is clearly pretty annoyed about it. Uh, the tweets that we had seen from President Trump uh, this morning reflect pretty accurately where he is. He thinks these questions are a waste of his time, and he doesn't want to talk about it. He'd rather talk about anything else. And, Evan, do I have my math right? Are we on the day three now with no answers from the White House about lies exposed by, exposed by the Cohen tape? That's exactly right. Three days of the president not saying anything about it, being asked about it, the White House also being asked about it, referring questions to the president's outside lawyers, and also, I should note, Anderson, not having any White House press briefings to answer any questions at all. Sarah Sanders' last brief for about 15 minutes on Monday. The White House has only had three press briefings all month. Uh, this is the White House retreating from inquiries about all of these controversies swirling around this president. Uh, they don't want want to talk about it and they're not giving reporters opportunities to do it when they are pressed on it they are lashing out at reporters as we've seen this week uh, the White House uh, is really leaving this uh, out in the open allowing these questions to continue to swirl around this president yeah, three press briefings in a month wow Abby Phillip thanks so much more now on what Michael Cohen might say the damage he could do and some of the other evidence we can look to to help determine who's telling the truth here joining us for that 
CNN political analyst Carl Bernstein, who shares the byline in this remarkable scoop and has been there before. Also with us, New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman, whose voice you heard in our opening page, and CNN chief legal analyst uh, Jeffrey Tubin. Um, I mean, Maggie, it's, again, this odd situation where you, this is a story involving two people who are not known for their truth-telling. Right. I think um, it's interesting looking at that cascade of things, uh, statements from Rudy Giuliani, who is the president's current lawyer. Um, people who uh, get around Donald Trump tend to take on his personality. This has been uh, a habit that we have seen through the campaign. We have seen it through his career in business. Um, I think when Michael Cohen was working for Donald Trump, uh, he said things that were not true. I think you see Rudy Giuliani now saying things that are not true. Giuliani told us of that tape of Michael Cohen um, and Donald Trump that it was, quote-unquote, exculpatory. Um, um, he described a, a series of, of uh, events on this tape um, that did not quite play out once you heard the audio. And so I think that you are you are seeing Giuliani try to pit Trump's credibility against Michael Cohen's and suggest that Trump will win. Um, you, you can't. There is a problem, and this was the issue for them during the campaign. The corrosive lying and the corrosive distorting and the corrosive uh, lack of telling the truth, it does have an impact at a certain point. And you can't just keep saying to people, you're not hearing what you're hearing. Now, look, Michael Cohen contradicted himself, I think. Um, I think he said something a little different to Congress uh, about the Trump Tower meeting, and he will have to deal with that if he gets called by Mueller's investigators. Uh, but I do think that when you look in aggregate at what this White House has said, the myriad things, I mean, I, I never quite get over Jay Sekulow saying that the president wasn't involved in drafting that statement. That was my reporting he was responding that. to, um, and it was not true. He may not have been uh, being told the truth, but this is the problem we hear over and over again. Well, this is the president saying, or this is this client saying, then quit or don't parrot it if you don't believe it. Um, again, we will see what gets said to federal investigators. It is a crime to lie to them. Michael Cohen has not yet been contacted by them as far as we know. Um, how that plays out remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, uh, Donald Trump, uh, the president has never been under oath about this meeting, so there's no law he would have broke. I mean, if he was lying, he's just lying to the American public and to reporters. C correct. Although Donald Trump Jr. may have a problem because he, under oath to a congressional committee, said he did not discuss this with his father in advance. So if Michael Cohen is telling the truth, Donald, J Donald Trump Jr. may have a problem. But it's also important to remember why this issue is important. This isn't just some random meeting. This is a meeting between the Rus representatives of the Russian government giving dirt, the, so the Trump campaign thought, to the leaders of the Trump campaign. So every time the president says there was no collusion, I, I had no, no, nothing to do with any Russians, this meeting, if in fact he knew about it at the time, shows that all of those statements, every time he said no collusion, is a lie. So it's not just sort of a random lie about the size of the inaugura inauguration crowd. It's lying about his involvement with the Russian government in the campaign. And Carl, I mean, if the meeting was squeaky clean with nothing improper, why have there been so many iterations to, you know, as to, to who was there, who knew about it, what exactly took place, what the whole purpose of it was? Let's be clear about this meeting. This meeting was convened for the purposes of colluding. That was the invitation that was extended to Donald Trump Jr. Uh, by Mr. Goldstone on behalf of Russian representatives to bring dirt to a meeting about Hillary Clinton uh, at the behest of the Russian government, it said in the letter of introduction, as it were. So this meeting is unique. It is hugely important. And thus far, from the moment we have learned about it, absolutely every aspect of it has been attempted to be covered up by Donald Trump and those around him. He has been truthful about nothing having to do with this meeting. Uh, why? Because, indeed, it's indicative of collusion. Now, is this the one time, perhaps, now that Mr. Cohen has said this, that Donald Trump is telling the truth about this meeting and that he did not know of it in advance, whereas he has lied about every other aspect of it almost? 
it's possible, I suppose. Uh, but you and others have run through the chronology of what occurred and what he said three days after uh, the, the invitation was extended and his son yeah. uh, knew about it. That It's very strange, all these coincidences, uh, and it's going to get sorted out. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing Donald Trump, according to people around him in the White House, acting so desperately and unhinged yeah. in his fury. You know, I mean, Maggie, the thing I keep coming back to about this meeting, and I'll probably repeat this several times tonight, is that if we are to be, if, if they are to be believed, Donald Trump Jr. is informed that the Kremlin is supporting his father's campaign, mm -hmm. and he chooses, and even though Paul Manafort's in that meeting and, and Kushner's in that meeting, he chooses not to tell his father either in advance or after the meeting this pretty stunning idea, true or not, that the Kremlin is supporting your campaign. I mean, for, for such a small organization, a small campaign at that point, it's pretty hard to imagine that. What I'm not clear, so there's a couple of things that I would say about that. Um, it's not clear to me what, uh, whether Cohen is going to say or is prepared to say or has told people that he was, that Donald Trump Sr. was briefed after this meeting or before this meeting took place. And there is a distinction and here's why. I could see a world just knowing how people are around Donald Trump and afraid of incurring his wrath or being accused of not being competent or any number of things that he says to some of his nearest and dearest. Um, if you go and tell him that actually this thing did not result in anything, I don't know what the, this didn't happen, uh, you are going to get dismissed. So it's possible that he was not briefed after. The question is whether he was briefed before. Mm -hmm. To me, that is the big question mark. And I don't know the answer. I think that generally speaking in that campaign, uh, people did not do things without Donald Trump knowing. And um, not everything, but most times. And there's, but there's another very important fact that, that plays into what people knew when, which is Donald Trump's announcement that he's going to give a big speech about Hillary Clinton's misdeeds involving right. Russia, right. among other countries. He gives that announcement of the speech when the, in the lead up to this meeting. Right. The meeting turns out to be a bust, and Donald Trump never gives this promised speech. How does Donald Trump decide to give a big speech on this subject without knowing that the, 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 the Trump Tower meeting is taking place? And how does he decide to cancel the speech without knowing that the meeting is a bust? That's a chronology that's very hard to explain. And, and, and certainly, Carl, and what we have seen in this president is he's not great about keeping some his cards close to the chest he does like to promo something he does like to promote uh, something in advance you know watch for some big thing revelation coming up or big news on a summit or whatever it may be it, it, to jeff's point it's entirely possible that he you know knew about this meeting and decided to kind of give a little promo well that's what it what it certainly would look like and appears uh, a perfectly reasonable assumption from from what he said. Let me add one more piece of information that I that I learned in the last few days, uh, not from any source connected to Cohen or uh, Cohen's attorneys. Uh, but this is that there was a weekly family meeting convened by Donald Trump at which he presided over through the whole campaign, at which almost everything, from what I gather, uh, of importance in the campaign was discussed. Now, whether or not the meeting that, that uh, Mr. Cohen is referring to, uh, assuming that it existed in the way he, he is talking about it, is a family meeting, I don't know. Uh, but there is a part of the whole campaign process in which the family was fully briefed uh, and in interacted with one another on all the major happenings in the campaign. Perhaps Donald Trump kept some things from his children, uh, that's possible, and from his son-in-law, uh, and vice versa. I suppose that's possible too. But we now have a picture of the family involvement around this one meeting that's starting to coalesce uh, in a way that is very distressing okay. to Donald Trump's legal team and the people around him. Maggie, Donald Trump Sr. did not attend those meetings. It was always the children. Um, the children just meeting with each other. Correct. With and, so that, and, and with oh, some of the campaign oh, you mean, meetings. But you that's mean an the important family distinction. Meeting. Correct. That's an important distinction. Okay. So just if we're talking about the history of the campaign, mm. that is how that was so, but, about. but it was a regular kind of family meeting of just the kids. It was a, just the kids and then sometimes some campaign aides. I, I think it's also worth mentioning another part of Carl's story that he wrote with Jim Shooter yesterday at C on CNN.com. According to Cohen, there are other people present 
at the meeting where he found out that Donald Trump Sr. knew about the, the Trump Tower meeting. Their testimony may be more important than anyone else's because maybe their credibility is better than Donald Trump's or Michael Cohen's. Corroboration is always indispensable when it comes to these swearing contests. You know, do, are there emails, are there texts, are there tapes, or other witnesses who can confirm or refute what Michael Cohn says about this meeting? That may be more important than Cohn's testimony itself because his credibility is so down. I mean, there are a lot of wins for for the president for his administration. Just th this week, North Korea returning uh, what seemed to be or has to be confirmed remains of, mm -hmm. of U.S. service members. Uh, certainly, economic numbers uh, mm -hmm. on uh, on GDP growth. All things are, are good for him. But also this week, the CFO of the Trump Organization yeah. uh, is subpoenaed. And, and this tape emerged, which seemed to prove that the president lied about about right. his knowledge about Karen McDougal's deal with AMI. Look, every time they start, for, there's two things going on. One is that the White House cannot co tell a consistent story about, uh, not just about these issues, but about their own accomplishments. So that is one thing, because the president will then tweet something like he did this morning. It's not like he's somebody who says these are distractions and I don't want to talk about this the way we've seen uh, other politicians do. Um, but I, we have not talked about the Alan Weisselberg um, uh, appearance before the grand jury that is pending, and this is related to the Cohen case in the Southern District of New York. And that is a huge deal. Because he knows ways, everything. Everything. He is synonymous with Trump's money. And so if you are looking at trying to unravel things that, that, that could be problematic for Donald Trump over decades, this is not just over the last year. He, right, he was working for Donald Trump's father. He worked for Donald Trump's father. He was uh, involved in the Trump Foundation. He is uh, involved in the Trump Organization. He is involved in uh, Trump's uh, personal trust, the money that was moved over after uh, he became president. And he reviewed the campaign's books at various points. He literally knows everything. I feel like that was the um, that is getting overshadowed by this talk about what Cohen may or may not say. Mm -hmm. And in reality, the Alan Weisselberg uh, uh, call toward the grand jury is a, is a, an enormous deal. Uh, Maggie Haberman, Carl Bernstein, Jeff Tubin, thanks very much. Just ahead, how these developments play into the larger strategic question of Russian influence in American politics and policy. Lieutenant Ralph Peters, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Uh, um, We'll have plenty to say about that when we come back. And later, two attorneys, each with skin in the game, clash Michael Avenatti and Alan Dershowitz tonight on 360. Successful business people, with all the experience you've gained in the professional world, have you ever thought about being a business consultant? Being your own boss. ConsultX is the online software application with all the resources, training, and support you'll need to become the owner of your own consultancy business. Go to ConsultX.com to get started today. That's ConsultX.com. There's no question that President Trump has a documented history of exaggeration, embellishment, even lies. And the president's private attorney, Rudy Giuliani, says now Michael Cohen has a history of lying as well. Despite, as was reported, saying the opposite a few months ago, so the question, of course, tonight, who to believe? Let's ask for author and retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Colonel Peters, as a former intelligence officer, I imagine you, you've had plenty of experience with laws and, and deception and trying to figure it out. Given that both the president and Michael Cohen have, should we say, a complicated relationship with the truth, who do you believe here? In this specific case, it sounds like Michael Cohen is the more honest of the two because he claims that other people were at the meeting uh, where Trump was told in advance about the meeting with the Russians. And if he can name the other people and they're compelled to testify and they corroborate his story, well, you know, then you've got an interesting case. But Anderson, even beyond the he said, she said, or he said, he said, think about it. Um, can you imagine if Donald Trump Jr. or any member of Trump's family has scheduled a meeting in Trump Tower with Russian representatives to get dirt about Hillary Clinton, invited other senior Trump staff members, and didn't tell Daddy? I mean, Trump would have exploded. You, you would have heard it from the Bronx to Beverly Hills. It's just not the way the world works. But Donald Trump, as incompetent as he may be at other things, from, from business to strategy, he's a genius at PR and, and propaganda. And what Trump understands, and what so many of us fail to understand, is that the truth barely has a chance against a lie that people want to believe. And during his campaign, and right up to this day, and I'm sure in the future, Trump has and will tell lies that people want to believe. Just today, I had an exchange with a Trump supporter, an educated man who spent much of his life 
working against the Russians. And it is impossible to reason with him. He is immune to evidence. Well, it's also interesting. It's not just a lie. It's a lie repeated over and over and over and over again. You know, it becomes almost a brand name sometimes, some of these lies or these taglines, and, and it, it's hard to fight against. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, when you have a plethora, a flood of lies, it does obscure the truth. Uh, you can suffocate the truth with lies. But also, again, repetition is very, very important. Any propagandist throughout history has recognized that. And Trump, you know, our intelligentsia may mock his repetition of simple slogans, or deep state, uh, witch hunt, uh, crooked Hillary, um, I take your pick. Fake news, but those, that sort of thing. Yeah, fake news, certainly fake news. But those simple binary combinations are easy to remember. Two word combinations, most of them monosyllabic words. They have incredible staying power. They're like those awful commercial jingles that you hate, but you go into the store and you look at which, which of the thousand rolls of toilet paper do I buy, and that jingle sticks to your head. The, the, Trump insinuates into your head. The other thing that, that strikes me about that meeting in Trump Tower is that if Donald Trump Jr. is informed that Russia wants the candidate, wants Donald Trump to win. I just, it just defies logic that Donald Trump Jr. would not say something to his own father. Yeah. Hey, you know what? I, I don't know if this is true or not, but we're being told that Russia actually wants you to win. I mean, that's a stunning thing for any candidate. Yeah, and, and Donald Trump wants to be in the loop. His specialty actually has been keeping other people out of the loop letting them in only selectively, but he wants to be the master of information. So again, it is utterly inconceivable to me that any member of Trump's family would have scheduled, or any of his staff would have scheduled such a meeting without getting him, not just telling him, but getting his blessing. Just, you don't just roll your own on stuff like this. Just lastly, Putin today said he, he's invited President Trump to Moscow, which the White House says that they're open to. Putin also said he's ready to come to Washington, praise the president for fulfilling his campaign, campaign promises. I'm wondering what you make of, of this latest exchange here. Well, perhaps uh, President Trump can visit some old girlfriends. But um, it's, look, Trump, uh, Putin doesn't want to come here because he knows it would be a spectacle. There's so much anger toward him in Russia. But by inviting Trump to Moscow, he can lay on all the military parades that Trump loves. He can give him literally uh, the czarist royal treatment. And so uh, I think it's a smart move on Putin's point. And there, there's so much else uh, involved in all this. But I, I'll go back to one, something I said at the start of the show. Uh, the big lie, repeated over and over again, the lie that people want to believe can beat the truth. And you know, the Washington Post now on its masthead, it has a, a phrase that the truth, uh, uh, democracy dies in darkness. That's not really true. Democracy dies in broad daylight mm. if good citizens do nothing, and too many of us are doing nothing in the age of Trump. Mm. Colonel Peters, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as the week ends, one of the biggest storylines, of course, has been the very public separation between the president and his one fixer, his personal lawyer, Michael Cohn. Coming up, I'll talk with Michael Avenatti and Professor Alan Dershowitz about who they believe may be telling the truth amidst all the fire and fury, so to speak. Been putting off buying new glasses? Zenni Optical offers a huge variety of high-quality, stylish frames and state-of-the-art optics, starting at just $6.95. We've got all the great frame styles you want, in materials like titanium, carbon fiber, and high-luster acetate. Plus, Zenni offers prescription glasses and sunglasses, so at this great price, you can build your eyewear wardrobe. You can get 10% off your entire order with code 360. So visit Zenni, Z-E-N-N-I, today at zennioptical.com and use code 360.
Good evening. It says something about the kind of week we've seen, or month, or year, or three for that matter, that the big question tonight is, who are you going to believe? Someone not known for telling the truth, or someone on record having made more than 3,000 false or misleading statements since becoming president? It says even more, perhaps, that this entire deeply offensive notion also seems to be the president's entire defensive strategy tonight. As CNN was first to report, sources tell us that Michael Cohen is prepared to tell Russia's special counsel Robert Mueller that candidate Trump had advanced knowledge of the now infamous June 2016 meeting between his son, his son-in-law, and campaign chairman and Russians promising Kremlin intelligence on Hillary Clinton. In short, if Mr. Cohen is to be believed, everything that the candidate and later president, his son, the president's lawyers, and spokespeople have been saying ever since has been false. And the defense, that's pretty rich. It boils down to this. Don't believe him. He's a liar. Pot, meat, kettle. I did not know of the meeting with my son, Don Jr., the president tweeted this morning. Sounds to me like someone is trying to make up stories in order to get himself out of an unrelated jam. Taxi cabs, maybe? He even retained Bill and Crooked Hillary's lawyer. Gee, I wonder if they helped him make the choice. <clears throat> no further reaction on his, on, uh, on his way to another weekend at the golf course, but the forecast is for rain, so look, there may be more tweeting this weekend. Also, no reaction from Don Jr., seen here today in what must have been a somewhat awkward moment, waiting close behind a seated Robert Mueller to board the same flight at Reagan National Airport in Washington. The two did not speak, making it the one meeting we absolutely positively know all there is to know about. No need to take anyone's word on that, especially not, say, Michael Cohen's. Here's the president's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, talking to CNN's Chris Cuomo about the president's former confidant. I expected something like this from Cohen. He's been lying all week. I mean, or, or for two, he's been lying for years. Lying for years, he says, which is strange because that means Michael Cohen must have been no less a liar when Rudy Giuliani was praising him for not being a liar. So was Mr. Giuliani lying in that clip you just heard or lying in this one from just a couple months ago? The man is an honest, honorable lawyer. It all becomes clear right now. It's confusing, to say the least. The honest, honorable lawyer has also been deeply dishonest for years, or at least this week. Maybe it's like truthful hyperbole or something, or maybe like so much else these days, it's yet another thing that would be funny if it weren't so serious. After all, this assertion by Michael Cohen, if true, casts serious doubt on the president's longtime claims of no collusion with Russia. If true, what else would, be, would this be except the candidate having knowledge of or complicity in a form of premeditated collaboration or attempted collaboration with a hostile foreign power in the middle of its attack on American democracy. Now, you'll remember the meeting was in June of 2016, but we didn't learn about it till the following summer. The campaign never spoke of it, nor the participants, nor the transition team, nor later the White House or the president. No one said anything until the New York Times broke the story last July. And when people did talk, the first response was to be misleading about what was discussed and to loudly make the claim that be, that's being disputed tonight that the president knew nothing about it before, after, and even a year after the fact. Did you tell your father anything about this? No. Uh, it was such a nothing. There was nothing to tell. Look, here, here's what happened. Donald Trump Jr. put it all out today. It's all out. After did you know at the time that they had the No, I didn't know anything about the meeting. Let's focus on what the president was aware of. Nothing. He was not aware of the meeting. This must have been a very important, a very, must have been a very unimportant meeting because I never even heard of that. I mean, I wouldn't have even remembered it until you start scouring through the stuff. It was, it was literally just a wasted 20 minutes, which was a shame. No one told you a word, nothing. I nobody told you. I complain a little bit, but nobody... No, nobody okay. told me. I didn't know that. You know, it's you... a very unimportant... It sounded like a very unimportant meeting. The president has stated very clearly that he was not aware of the meeting and did not attend the meeting. This is not a situation where the president was involved in this meeting, was not aware of the meeting, did not attend this meeting. When did the president learn that that meeting had taken place? Uh, I believe in the last couple of days, is my understanding. You didn't know about this meeting until a few days ago? Yes, that's correct. Mm. Yeah, he only found out a few days before. He was not aware of the meeting. He was not involved. It sounded unimportant. It was such a nothing. Okay, but keeping him honest, if, if it was such a nothing, why did everyone from the president on down start lying about it the moment it became known? Remember, first the meeting was billed as being primarily about American adoption of Russian children. That was a lie. Then came more false statements about who was actually responsible for that bogus statement. I wasn't involved in the statement drafting at all, uh, nor was the president. I'm assuming that was between Mr. Uh, Donald Trump Jr., between Don Jr. and his lawyer. So that was July 11th of last year. No presidential involvement at all. By early August, no involvement became some involvement. The statement that Don Jr. issued is true. There's no inaccuracy in the statement. The president weighed in as any father would based on the limited information that he had. 
Well, seven months later, Jay Sekulow was forced to admit in a letter to the special counsel that President Trump had, in fact, dictated what he characterized as a short but accurate statement. Not just weighed in, as any dad might, but dictated it, accurate or not. Now, the consensus is not. In any event, it didn't stop his colleague, Rudy Giuliani, just last month from offering up this heap and helping of word salad. I think it's a case. I mean, I obviously asked Jay about this. Uh, I think he was uninformed at the time, just like I was uh, when I came into the case. He, he was just in the case. Uh, this is a point that maybe wasn't clarified in terms of recollection and his understanding of it. And what Jay did was he, he, he immediately uh, corrected it. Uh, and even if it had been an oath, you would call that recanting. And, and it's Jay, not the president. So that's the wisdom of not having a president testify. Uh, it's one thing to do it with a lawyer. Yeah. It's another thing to do it with, 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 with your client. So got it? Makes sense now? The president's defenders can't seem to keep their story straight about the bogus story the president concocted about the meeting that they were misleading about after concealing for a year. That's one side of the equation. On the other side, the president's turncoat attorney, who might or might not be telling the truth about his serially less than honest former client, that's where we are tonight. And so is this. Two years ago to the day, candidate Donald Trump, just a few weeks after the Trump Tower meeting, he either did or did not know in advance about, stood up and said this to the country he's now accused of colluding with. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. I think you will probably be rewarded mightily by our press. As we said, the president left town without answering questions about this or anything else, which does not mean there was no news at the White House today, just the opposite. Seeing as Abby Phillips joins us now, has the White House any official response to this news about the Trump Tower meeting? They have not. The White House has not offered anything in the way of clarification about many of the comments that you just played there made from the podium by the press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And the president, as you just mentioned, left town without making any statements at all, leaving this as simply his word against his former lawyers. Uh, but the president tried this morning in a tweet uh, to, to preempt questions from reporters by saying, denying the story, saying that he did not know anything about this meeting with uh, Don, Don Jr and those Russians, uh, but he does not want clearly to answer any questions from reporters about it at all, and that, that is not really how this works. The White House won't submit to any sort of inquiries at all from uh, White House reporters about what they make of this new reporting and how that squares with all of those past statements denying any knowledge whatsoever from the president uh, about that meeting, Anderson. Do we have any idea what the mood of the president is right now amidst all this? Well, he is clearly very angry. A White House source t told us this week that he has been stewing for days about all of this reporting, watching the coverage on television. And he's angry not just with his former lawyer, Michael Cohen, but also with reporters who continue to ask him about this at all these opportunities. They tried to change the subject this morning uh, at a pretty hastily put together press conference in the Rose Garden. Uh, the press reporters kept feet away from the president, and the president just turned and walked out of the room after. But those questions kept coming, and President Trump is clearly pretty annoyed about it. Uh, the tweets that we have seen from President Trump uh, this morning reflect pretty accurately where he is. He thinks these questions are a waste of his time, and he doesn't want to talk about it. He'd rather talk about anything else. And, Evan, do I have my math right? Are we on the day three now with no answers from the White House about lies exposed by, exposed by the Cohen tape? That's exactly right. Three days of the president not saying anything about it, being asked about it, the White House also being asked about it, referring questions to the president's outside lawyers, and also, I should note, Anderson, not having any White House press briefings to answer any questions at all. Sarah Sanders last brief for about 15 minutes on Monday. The White House has only had three press briefings all month. Uh, this is the White House retreating from inquiries about all of these controversies swirling around this president. Uh, they don't want want to talk about it, and they're not giving reporters opportunities to do it. When they are pressed on it, they are lashing out at reporters, as we've seen this week. Uh, the White House uh, is really leaving this uh, out in the open, allowing these questions to continue to swirl around this president. Yeah. Three press briefings in a month. Wow. Abby Phillips, thanks so much. More now on what Michael Cohen might say, the damage he could do, and some of the other evidence we can look to to help determine who's telling the truth here. Joining us for that. CNN political analyst Carl Bernstein, who shares the byline in this remarkable scoop and has been there before. Also with us, New York Times White House correspondent Maggie Haberman, whose voice you heard in our opening page, and CNN chief legal analyst uh, Jeffrey Tubin. Um, I mean, Maggie, it's, again, this odd situation where you, this is a story involving two people who are not known for 
they're truth telling. Right. I think um, it's interesting looking at that cascade of things, uh, statements from Rudy Giuliani, who is the president's current lawyer. Um, people who uh, get around Donald Trump tend to take on his personality. This has been uh, a habit that we have seen through the campaign. We have seen it through his career in business. Um, I think when Michael Cohen was working for Donald Trump, uh, he said things that were not true. I think you see Rudy Giuliani now saying things that are not true. Giuliani told us of that tape of Michael Cohen um, and Donald Trump that it was, quote unquote, exculpatory. Um, he described a, a series of, of uh, <laughs> events on this tape um, that did not quite play out once you heard the audio. And so I think that you are, you are seeing Giuliani try to pit Trump's credibility against Michael Cohen's and suggest that Trump will win. Um, you, you can't, there is a problem, and this was the issue for them during the campaign, the corrosive lying and the corrosive distorting and the corrosive uh, lack of telling the truth, it does have an impact at a certain point. And you can't just keep saying to people, you're not hearing what you're hearing. Now, look, Michael Cohen contradicted himself, I think. Um, I think he said something a little different to Congress uh, about the Trump Tower meeting, and he will have to deal with that if he gets called by Mueller's investigators. Uh, but I do think that when you look in aggregate at what this White House has said, the myriad things, I mean, I, I never quite get over Jay Sekulow saying that the president wasn't involved in drafting that statement. That was my reporting he was responding that. to, um, and it was not true. He may not have been uh, being told the truth, but this is the problem we hear over and over again. Well, this is the president saying, or this is this client saying, then quit or don't parrot it if you don't believe it. Um, again, we will see what gets said to federal investigators. It is a crime to lie to them. Michael Cohen has not yet been contacted by them as far as we know. Um, how that plays out remains to be seen. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, uh, Donald Trump, uh, the president has never been under oath about this meeting, so there's no law he would have broke. I mean, if he was lying, he's just lying to the American public and to reporters. C correct, although Donald Trump Jr. may have a problem because he, under oath to a congressional committee, said he did not discuss this with his father in advance. So if Michael Cohen is telling the truth, Donald, J Donald Trump Jr. may have a problem. But it's also important to remember why this issue is important. This isn't just some random meeting. This is a meeting between the Rus representatives of the Russian government giving dirt, the, so the Trump campaign thought, to the leaders of the Trump campaign. So every time the president says there was no collusion, I, I had no, no, nothing to do with any Russians, this meeting, if in fact he knew about it at the time, shows that all of those statements, every time he said no collusion, is a lie. So it's not just sort of a random lie about the size of the inaugura inauguration crowd. It's lying about his involvement with the Russian government in the campaign. And Carl, I mean, if the meeting was squeaky clean with nothing improper, why have there been so many iterations to, you know, to, to who's there, who knew about it, what exactly took place, what the whole purpose of it was? Let's be clear about this meeting. This meeting was convened for the purposes of colluding. That was the invitation that was extended to Donald Trump Jr. Uh, by Mr. Goldstone on behalf of Russian representatives to bring dirt to a meeting about Hillary Clinton uh, at the behest of the Russian government, it said in the letter of introduction, as it were. So this meeting is unique. It is hugely important. And thus far, from the moment we have learned about it, absolutely every aspect of it has been attempted to be covered up by Donald Trump and those around him. He has been truthful about nothing having to do with this meeting. Uh, why? because indeed it's indicative of collusion. Now, is this the one time perhaps now that Mr. Cohen has said this, that Donald Trump is telling the truth about this meeting and that he did not know of it in advance, whereas he has lied about every other aspect of it almost? It's possible, I suppose. Uh, but you and others have run through the chronology of what occurred and what he said three days after uh, the, the invitation was extended and his son yeah. uh, knew about it. That it's very strange, all these coincidences, uh, and it's going to get sorted out. And I think that's one of the reasons we're seeing Donald Trump, according to people around him in the White House, acting so desperately and unhinged yeah. in his fury. Yeah, well, I mean, Maggie, the thing I keep coming back to about this meeting, and I probably will repeat this several times tonight, is that if we are to be, if, if they are to be believed, 
Donald Trump Jr. is informed that the Kremlin is supporting his father's campaign, mm -hmm. and he chooses, and even though Paul Manafort's in that meeting and, and Kushner's in that meeting, he chooses not to tell his father either in advance or after the meeting this pretty stunning idea, true or not, that the Kremlin is supporting your campaign. I mean, for, for such a small organization, a small campaign at that point, it's pretty hard to imagine that. What I'm not clear, so there's a couple of things that I would say about that. Um, it's not clear to me what uh, whether Cohen is going to say or is prepared to say or has told people that he was that Donald Trump Sr. was briefed after this meeting or before this meeting took place. And there is a distinction, and here's why. I could see a world just knowing how people are around Donald Trump and afraid of incurring his wrath or being accused of not being competent or any number of things that he says to some of his nearest and dearest. Um, if you go and tell him that actually this thing did not result in anything, I don't know what, that this didn't happen, uh, you are going to get dismissed. So it's possible that he was not briefed after. The question is whether he was briefed before. Mm. To me, that is the big question mark. And I don't know the answer. I think that, generally speaking, in that campaign, uh, people did not do things without Donald Trump knowing. And, um, not everything, but most times. And there's, but there's another very important fact that, that plays into what people knew when, which is Donald Trump's announcement that he's going to give a big speech about Hillary Clinton's misdeeds That's involving right. Russia, right. among other countries. He gives that announcement of the speech when the, in the lead-up to this meeting. Right. The meeting turns out to be a bust, and Donald Trump never gives this promised speech. How does Donald Trump decide to give a big speech on this subject without knowing that the, 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 the Trump Tower meeting is taking place? And how does he decide to cancel the speech without knowing that the meeting is a bust? That's a chronology that's very hard to explain. And, and certainly, Carl, and what we have seen in this president is he's not great about keeping some his cards close to the chest. He does like to promo something. He does like to promote uh, something in advance, you know, watch for some big thing, revelation coming up or big news on a summit or whatever it may be. It, in, to Jeff's point, it's entirely possible that he, you know, knew about this meeting and decided to kind of give a little promo. Well, that's what it, what it certainly would look like and appears uh, a perfectly reasonable assumption from, from what he said. Let me add one more piece of information that I, that I learned in the last few days, uh, not from any source connected to Cohen or uh, Cohen's attorneys, uh, but this is that there was a weekly family meeting convened by Donald Trump, at which he presided over through the whole campaign, at which almost everything, from what I gather, uh, of importance in the campaign was discussed. Now, whether or not the meeting that, that uh, Mr. Cohen is referring to, uh, assuming that it existed in the way he, he is talking about it, is a family meeting, I don't know. Uh, but there is a part of the whole campaign process in which the family was fully briefed uh, and in interacted with one another on all the major happenings in the campaign. Perhaps Donald Trump kept some things from his children, uh, that's possible, and from his son-in-law, uh, and vice versa. I suppose that's possible, too. But we now have a picture of the family involvement around this one meeting that's starting to coalesce uh, in a way that is very distressing okay. to Donald Trump's legal team and the people around him. Maggie, Donald yes. Trump Sr. did not attend those meetings. It was always the children. Um, the children just meeting with each other. Correct. With and, so that, and, and with oh, some of the campaign Oh, you mean, meetings, you mean the family distinction. Meeting. Correct. That's an important distinction. Okay. So just if we're talking about the history of the campaign, mm. that is how that was. So, but, about. but it was a regular kind of family meeting of just the kids. It was a, just the kids and then sometimes some campaign aides. I, I think it's also worth mentioning another part of Carl's story that he wrote with Jim Shudo yesterday at C on CNN.com. According to Cohen, there are other people present at the meeting where he found out that Donald Trump Sr. knew about the, the Trump Tower meeting their testimony may be more important than anyone else's because maybe their credibility is better than Donald Trump's or Michael Cohen's. Corroboration is always indispensable when it comes to these swearing contests. You know, do, are there emails? Are there texts? Are there tapes? 
or other witnesses who can confirm or refute what Michael Cohn says about this meeting. That may be more important than Cohn's testimony itself because his credibility is so down. I mean, there are a lot of wins for for the president, for his administration. Just th this week, North Korea returning uh, what seemed to be, or it has to be confirmed, remains of, mm -hmm. of U.S. service members, uh, certainly economic numbers uh, mm -hmm. on, uh, on GDP growth. All things are, are good for him, but also this week, the CFO of the Trump Organization yeah. uh, is subpoenaed and, and this tape emerged, which seemed to prove that the president lied about right. about his knowledge about Karen McDougal's deal with AMI. Look, every time they start, for, there's two things going on. One is that the White House cannot co tell a consistent story about, uh, not just about these issues, but about their own accomplishments. So that is one thing, because the president will then tweet something like he did this morning. It's not like he's somebody who says, these are distractions and I don't want to talk about this, the way we've seen uh, other politicians do. Um, but I, we have not talked about the Alan Weisselberg um, uh, appearance before the grand jury that is pending. And this is related to the Cohen case in the Southern District of New York. And that is a huge deal. Because he knows ways, everything. Everything. He is synonymous with Trump's money. And so if you are looking at trying to unravel things that, that, that could be problematic for Donald Trump over decades, this is not just over the last year. He, right, he was working for Donald Trump's father. He worked for Donald Trump's father. He was uh, involved in the Trump Foundation. He is uh, involved in the Trump Organization. He is involved in uh, Trump's uh, personal trust, the money that was moved over after uh, he became president. And he reviewed the campaign's books at various points. He literally knows everything. I feel like that was the um, that is getting overshadowed by this talk about what Cohen may or may not say. Mm -hmm. And in reality, the Alan Weisselberg uh, uh, call toward the grand jury is a, is a, an enormous deal. Uh, Maggie Haberman, Carl Bernstein, Jeff Tubin, thanks very much. Just ahead, how these developments play into the larger strategic question of Russian influence in American politics and policy. Lieutenant Ralph Peters, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Uh, um, We'll have plenty to say about that when we come back. And later, two attorneys, each with skin in the game, clash Michael Avenatti and Alan Dershowitz tonight on 360. CNN New York. Colonel Peters is a former intelligence officer. I imagine.
No question that President Trump has a documented history of exaggeration, embellishment, even lies. And the president's private attorney, Rudy Giuliani, says now Michael Cohen has a history of lying as well, despite, as was reported, saying the opposite a few months ago. So the question, of course, tonight, who to believe? Let's ask for author and retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters. Colonel Peters, as a former intelligence officer, I imagine you, you've had plenty of experience with lies and, and deception and trying to figure it out. Given that both the president and Michael Cohen have, shall we say, a complicated relationship with the truth, who do you believe here? In this specific case, it sounds like Michael Cohen is the more honest of the two because he claims that other people were at the meeting uh, where Trump was told in advance about the meeting with the Russians. And if he can name the other people and they're compelled to testify and they corroborate his story, well, you know, then you've got an interesting case. But Anderson, even beyond the he said, she said, or he said, he said, think about it. Um, can you imagine if Donald Trump Jr. or any member of Trump's family had scheduled a meeting in Trump Tower with Russian representatives to get dirt about Hillary Clinton, invited other senior Trump staff members, and didn't tell daddy? I mean, Trump would have exploded. You, you would have heard it from the Bronx to Beverly Hills. It's just not the way the world works. But Donald Trump, as incompetent as he may be at other things, from, from business to strategy, he's a genius at PR and, and propaganda. And what Trump understands, and what so many of us fail to understand, is that the truth barely has a chance against a lie that people want to believe. And during his campaign, and right up to this day, and I'm sure in the future, Trump has and will tell lies that people want to believe. Just today, I had an exchange with a Trump supporter, an educated man who spent much of his life working against the Russians, and it is impossible to reason with him. He is immune to evidence. Well, it's also interesting. It's not just a lie. It's a lie repeated over and over and over and over again. Uh, you know, it becomes almost a brand name sometimes, some of these lies or these taglines, and, and it, it's hard to fight against. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, when you have a plethora, a flood of lies, it does obscure the truth. Uh, you can suffocate the truth with lies. But also, again, repetition is very, very important. Any propagandist throughout history has recognized that. And Trump, you know, our intelligentsia may mock his repetition of simple slogans, or deep state, uh, witch hunt, uh, crooked Hillary, um, I take your pick. Fake news, but those, that sort of thing. Yeah, fake news, certainly fake news. But those simple binary combinations are easy to remember. Two word combinations, most of them monosyllabic words. They have incredible staying power. They're like those awful commercial jingles that you hate, but you go into the store and you look at which which of the thousand rolls of toilet paper do I buy, and that jingle sticks to your head. The, the Trump other, insinuates into your head. The other thing that, that strikes me about that meeting in Trump Tower is that if Donald Trump Jr. is informed that Russia wants the candidate, wants Donald Trump to win, I just it just defies logic that Donald Trump Jr. would not say something to his own father, yeah. hey, you know what, I, I don't know if this is true or not, but we're being told that Russia actually wants you to win. I mean, that's a stunning thing for any candidate. Yeah, and, and Donald Trump wants to be in the loop. His specialty actually has been keeping other people out of the loop, letting them in only selectively, but he wants to be the master of information. So again, it is utterly inconceivable to me that any member of Trump's family would have scheduled, or any of his staff, would have scheduled such a meeting without getting him, not just telling him, but getting his blessing. Just, you don't just roll your own on stuff like this. Just lastly, I, Putin today said he, he's invited President Trump to Moscow, which the White House says that they're open to. Putin also said he's ready to come to Washington, praise the president for fulfilling his campaign, campaign promises. I'm wondering what you make of, of this latest exchange here. Well, perhaps uh, President Trump can visit some old girlfriends. But um, it's, look, Trump, uh, Putin doesn't want to come here because he knows it would be a spectacle. There's so much anger toward him in Russia. But by inviting Trump to Moscow, he can lay on all the military parades that Trump loves. He can give him literally uh, the czarist royal treatment. And so uh, I think it's a smart move in, on Putin's point. And there, there's so much else uh, involved in all this. But I, I'll go back to one, something I said at the start of the show. Uh, the big lie repeated over and over again, the lie that people want to believe 
can beat the truth. And you know, the Washington Post now on its masthead, it has a phrase that the truth, uh, uh, democracy dies in darkness. That's not really true. Democracy dies in broad daylight mm. if good citizens do nothing, and too many of us are doing nothing in the age of Trump. Mm. Colonel Peters, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as the week ends, one of the biggest storylines, of course, has been the very public separation between the president and his one fixer, his personal lawyer, Michael Cohn. Coming up, I'll talk with Michael Avenatti and then Professor Alan Dershowitz about who they believe may be telling the truth amidst all the fire and fury, so to speak. Michael, in the Michael, in the past, you've called Michael Cohen, quote, an absolute criminal. Th The release of that audio tape between Donald Trump and his one-time personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, and CNN's reporting from sources who say Cohen is claiming the president knew of the Trump Tower meeting has thrown the president's former fixer back squarely in the spotlight for what he may or may not say to Robert Mueller, but also how he's treated his one-time client, Donald Trump. 
It's a subject of much debate. We'll take them now between two attorneys who are no stranger to the spotlight themselves in this story. Michael Avenatti, Stormy Daniels' attorney, and Alan Dershowitz, who has emerged as one of the president's uh, defenders at time. He's the author of the best-selling new book, The Case Against Impeaching Trump. Michael, in the past, you've called Michael Cohen, quote, an absolute criminal thug. You've called him a co-conspirator. You're obviously in an ongoing legal battle with him on the Stormy Daniels case. In terms of this reporting and his claims about the president's knowledge of the Trump Tower meeting, do you think he's telling the truth here? Well, that's a good question, Anderson. I don't know if he's telling the truth. Um, I think he likely is telling the truth, but the guy has been all over the map for so many months and years um, that I think that as a witness, certainly there's questions as to his credibility. Professor Dershowitz, if the reporting turns out to be true, and that's a big if, and the president did know about the meeting, there were other, others present to corroborate Cohen's story, isn't that a major problem? Or is that a major problem for the president and Donald Trump Jr., who between the two of them have denied the president's knowledge of the meeting nine times? Oh, it's a political problem, to be sure, but I don't think it's a legal problem. Even if the president knew of the meeting, knew exactly the role of the woman who was there, that she was representing the Russian government, and even knew that uh, they were going to go to try to collect dirt that had already been gotten by the Russians on Hillary Clinton, that would be a political sin, but it wouldn't be a federal crime. And I think if this is the best that Cohen has to offer, uh, I don't think he's going to be given immunity by the uh, federal prosecutors. Uh, he may have to compose uh, and not only sing in order to get that kind of immunity, because this isn't very much from a legal point of view. It's a big deal from a political and public relations point of view, but legally it's, uh, it's a three on a scale of ten, maybe. Well, I mean, what's also interesting about Cohen's story on this, and again, if it turns out to be true, he claims that there are other people present who heard that as well. So if, if they're under oath, you know, I guess, you know, they could back up what Cohen uh, has to say if, in fact, that, that, and that if is it turns true. Out, and if it turns out there are no other people, right. that will affect his credibility as well. But I think the big picture is that even if everything he says is true, uh, it's not a crime. You know, in, in my new book, The Case Against Impeaching Trump, I set out a hypothetical based on this possibility, a hypothetical of even if the president actively sought uh, material, dirt on Hillary Clinton, terrible thing, but even if he sought it, but the dirt had already been gathered and he wasn't asking them to hack the DNC or do anything criminal, that would not be a crime. It would show, quote, perhaps collusion, but there's nothing in the federal code that makes collusion itself a crime. Well, Professor, I mean, about those tapes you tweeted yesterday, quote, I didn't say Michael Avenatti was wrong, but that if he's right, how did he access that confidential information? Talking about there being more tapes. He implied yeah. there were more Trump tapes. Giuliani says there's only one with Trump's voice. Let's see who's right. Do you stand by that? Well, I don't want to get personal at all, but I think there uh, it's hard to imagine how he could uh, have lawfully gotten a hold of those tapes. He did, according to press reports, have a conversation with uh, Mr. Cohn at a restaurant, and that raises some questions because, you know, you're not allowed to speak to somebody who's counseled, who has a lawyer, and, and ask him, do you want to work together to hurt uh, Trump? So I, I'm not, I don't know whether that occurred, but if it did occur, I think uh, Michael has to do some explaining. Michael? Well, Al Al Alan, let me, let me say this. You keep saying you don't want to get personal with me, and you keep getting personal with me, including on Fox the other well, night. I was asked I'm the question. You, well, no, I'm going to tell you, I, I don't appreciate it. I'm willing to put up my track record over the last six months in this case up against yours any day of the week. I have been very, very accurate in my predictions and the statements I've made um, and the facts. And the fact of the matter is, on Sunday, mm -hmm. you expressed considerable uh, doubt as to whether I knew what I was talking about. And within 48 hours, no, no, I, I was, I was, pro no, let me finish. And within 48 no, hours, I was proven right. I said right. it was true. I said it was well, true what you're talking about, and that's why it needs some explanation. You did guarantee the American public back in May that President Trump would resign. We're watching our watches and waiting to see if that prediction comes true. That's the one prediction that you really staked your reputation on, so your reputation will turn on whether he does resign or not. Well, Alan, let me tell you, I'm going to determine what my reputation turns on, not you. I've made many predictions that and have I been. To, let me let me finish. I've made many predictions that have turned out to be true, and we got two years left in this president's term. And despite the fact that he thinks you write great books, we're going to see what really happens. Well, Michael, I want to read you something that you tweeted back to the professor on Monday. You said, "I'm awaiting an apology from Alan Dershowitz and others who once again were proven wrong." I stated in late May during the pressure there were multiple recordings, and that was confirmed today. 
unlike others, including Mr. Trump, I don't make public statements that are false. Um, you, because you, it's now the Washington Post did report there, there are about 100 recordings. We don't know the full nature of those recordings. Well, back on May, I think it was 29th, Anderson, I stood in front of the federal courthouse um, and I demanded the release of all of the Trump tapes. And I stated at the time there were multiple recordings. And now uh, we know that there are indeed over 100 recordings that have been seized. And I also want to go back to something that was said earlier. Um, this information on the Trump Tower meeting, that's not the best information Michael Cohen has. I can assure you of that. W w it, how do you know how that? How do you know, do you you know that? that? That's my question. How, how, can, well, how, how I, can you assure us? Again, I'm not going to tell you how I know these things, but you know what, Alan, if you well, want to... You may uh, have to tell the ethics committee that. Uh, Alan, you may I have to have tell to... that to the ethics committee Alan, if they ask Alan. you how you had a conversation with a man who was represented by a lawyer and you didn't ask his lawyer's permission, and his lawyer is now apparently complaining about that. So you're going to have to answer some of these questions. It's not enough just for you to say selectively, I don't have to answer that question, but I will answer that question. Okay, Mike, let's Mike, not get personal, Alan, but let's understand Alan, that Alan, we have to have Alan, the truth. Yeah. Michael, Alan, your you, Alan, you really need to start talking only about things that you know about as opposed to things that you have no knowledge about. You have no knowledge of the communications that went on between me and Michael Cohen's representatives long before press. that, long before that, no. You don't know what you're talking about, Alan, long before mm -hmm. that restaurant meeting. You have no idea about the communications that went on relating to a particular or proposed level of cooperation. You just make it up as you go along. You need to so, go so back. So let me ask you, you need a to go specific back. question. Let me finish. Let me, no, let him finish. no, you let need him. to go back. Hey. You need to go back and concentrate on what invites you're getting on Martha's Vineyard, since that appears okay, to be what you're really good at. Well, I'm about to head off to a, a party, so I have to leave in a minute. But good let me tell that. you, uh, if, are you saying specifically that you were given permission by Michael Cohen's lawyer to have that conversation with him in the restaurant? That's a question you should answer specifically, because if you weren't given permission to have that conversation with Michael Cohen, you may have to answer to an ethics committee about that conversation because I taught legal ethics for 35 years and I know a lot about legal ethics and the one thing I know is you're not allowed to have a conversation with somebody who's counseled without the specific approval of the client to have that convers of the a lawyer to have that conversation. So I think you have to explain that meeting. Alan, Alan, guess who gave me permission? Michael Cohen. He gave me permission. That's so not once enough. again, that's no, not it enough. Is. Mike, that's not Alan, enough under Alan, the rules of ethics. Again, no, no, Alan, you're once wrong. Again, answer, Alan, Alan, yeah. Alan, once again, yeah. you don't know what you're talking about. You know what I want to know? I want to know about the relationship between you and Donald Trump. I think you ought to disclose the extent of the relationship. How did you get of that course, positive book? I'm happy book? to do it. How did you get that positive book review? Happy why is to, it that you two? Why it. is it that you two appear to be such close friends now? And I think you ought to disclose what your relationship is. I've met him three times in my life. All three times dealing with the Middle East. I have no relationship with him. But you have to tell you, I do know legal ethics, and getting permission from a counseled client You're wrong. to talk You're wrong. to that okay. client is not enough. Well, I can tell you, I've been teaching legal ethics for a long time. About that, I am 100% right. Michael, let me just ask you lastly, I want to ask you about the, the three additional women you say you're representing. You said that they're, they're also paid hush money. Can you tell us any more when that hush money was allegedly paid or anything else about the alleged relationships and, uh, and, and any proof that they happened? In 2015 and 2016, and I find it very interesting that we haven't seen a denial from Donald Trump or Michael Cohen all day. I would think that if I was wrong, we would have seen a denial. And, Alan, I feel sorry for the students that you taught legal ethics to, by the way, because you didn't teach them the truth. Well, they've become, they've become justices of the Supreme Court, judges, uh, sure. some of the most important people in America. I'm sure I they're very proud. I stand by my record of I'm teaching sure, legal ethics very proud. for a long, I'm sure, long time. I'm sure they're very I proud. I wish you had been in my... If you had been in my class, you would not have had that conversation with Michael Cohen. All right. Alan, I'm sure they're very proud. I'm sure they're very proud of your conduct they over are. the last two years. I'm Mike, sure. Michael Avenatti, they are. Hershowitz. They are. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, the worst best week at the White House. The president on the defensive, his White House gripped by one bombshell after the other and the multiple investigations against him. Also a triumphant president, taking credit for new strong economic numbers. More on that ahead.
Well, what a strange day it's likely been for the president. This morning he was uh, touting the, the state of the economy, new numbers out showing it's growing at the fastest pace in four years, up 4.1 percent in the second quarter. Also this morning, the president was angry, pushing back on all the things related to Michael Cohen, his former fixer. The two are now in an all-out war, as you know, as we've been reporting tonight. It's a tale of two White Houses, a mix of the good and the bad. Here to talk about it, CNN political commentator Van Jones, host of the Van Jones Show. Also, Jason Miller, former advisor to the Trump campaign. Um, Van, I mean, isn't the, the president overdue for some credit for these, these economic numbers? Look, absolutely. I, I, I've said many times uh, Obama got us moving in the right direction. Uh, Trump said we're moving in the wrong direction. He lied. That wasn't true. We're going the right direction. But the liberals said that Trump was going to screw it up. And they were wrong, too. Uh, the Obama numbers have gone in a straight line of unemployment coming down, uh, a good pass off to Trump. Both parties should be happy about it. The problem is, even though the economy is coming up, the society is coming apart. And the president is driving that level of division. And I think that's where uh, you know, you've got to continue to hold him accountable. Jason, uh, no doubt you would make the argument uh, as well that, that the president isn't getting the credit he deserves on the economy. I'm wondering how much responsibility he bears for that. You know, if every tweet about a witch hunt or a hoax were replaced by a tweet about the economy, wouldn't that wouldn't he be better served by that just in terms of a focused message? Well, absolutely. I think the White House does bear some of the responsibility for some of the messaging that comes out. And it's their uh, they obviously do have a big part of the say in what comes uh, what they're talking about each day. And they can either talk about the economy, they can talk about the successes that they're uh, pushing, or they can talk about the distraction. But I think there is this uh, this cloud, I think, that many of the detractors want to have over the White House. I call it, uh, in a sense, the the Jan Brady syndrome, where uh, many Many of the detractors, every time President Trump does anything good, they want to say Russia, Russia, Russia. In fact, I was watching Twitter this morning when the president was having his press conference, and I was shocked, really shocked, the number of journalists and even news outlets, folks who I really respect and have a, a great deal of admiration for, while the president is up at the podium talking about the growth numbers, uh, as you talked about, the best GDP numbers we've had in four years, that were just actively hitting the president on Russia and Cohen and Mueller. And the president literally couldn't even get through that press conference with folks hitting him. And again, I'm not saying that the president and the White House are immune from criticism. I'm not saying that they don't have days where they create some of the headaches for themselves. But it shocks me every time I see this where they literally won't let the president get up off the mat. Is part of the problem, though, Jason, they've only had three White House briefings in the last That's month. And, 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 you know, this tape has come out and which shows that the president uh, lied and the campaign lied about knowing about the deal with AMI and Karen McDougal. Um, and they've not said anything about it on the record. Well, I think to the point about the press briefings, I mean, the president's very accessible. I said when I was on the other night that I think he's one of the most open presidents that we've ever had in the White House, with the, whether it be the cabinet meetings or the uh, the different press sprays that he has when he brings folks in. Obviously, the one on Wednesday got a little bit off the rails. I think that's probably an understatement. And instead right. of talking but you can't say he's uh, open about when the they progress towards a trade reporter. deal. I mean, yeah, I, just, I mean, yeah, I no, and, 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 I, and, and, I, and I, man. How can you say the most open? They threw yeah. out one of our colleagues because you did her job and the, the other problem I think that, that we've got to be able to uh, face straight ahead is that when you have uh, the, uh, openness when you want to have it that's not transparency it's when you're able to stand up and take tough questions and be available and you can't then say look I want to be able to have a happy press conference about my happy topics and I'm going to be upset and throw a fit like a, like a toddler because somebody asked me a hard question that's what we're dealing with I, I do want to say one more thing though I'm surprised though that conservatives are not more upset with what's going on in the economy. I remember when uh, President Obama was in office. Because of deficits, we had the Tea Party marching all across the country. We now have massive deficits under Trump and no complaints at all. The, 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 the conservatives attacked Obama for bailing out the auto industry. Now you have Trump bailing out uh, the American farmers, basically taking farmers and moving them from work to welfare because of his trade war and not a, a, a peep. So yes, there's good economic performance, but it's based on massive deficit spending, which conservatives won't check, and a trade war, which makes no sense, and bailouts, which conservatives won't uh, criticize. So there is something going on in the economy that I'm surprised. You talk about being shocked. I'm shocked I don't hear people like you having more fidelity to your own conservative Jason, principles. What about that? 
Yeah, uh, Van, we're looking at unemployment numbers that are a 50-year low. We're seeing a trade deficit that's been reduced by $50 billion over this past quarter. And you and I both know uh, that the federal debt doubled uh, under President Obama, that we because need we had real a huge economic recession. growth if, we we're huge gonna go, economic if we're ever going to go. But, but again, but we, have the, but we have the slowest growth. We have yeah. the slowest since recovery since the last time we had a financial crash. Since World War II. Crash. This was last since World War II. You and, and I, I both know it was, that and financial it was the slowest recovery. Are hard to come back from. And it yep. was... Because Republican, and, and, and it was it was a, it was a slow recovery. And so, Van, what we needed is to go and jumpstart this economy and go get it moving. And I think that's what President Trump has done. And if we go back to the election of 2016, right after that election, you know as well as I do that every corporate leader in America thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so, and they were essentially thinking there were going to be higher taxes and higher regulation as a result of that. So, when President Trump won, they're almost playing with house money. They started investing in the in their companies, investing back in the economy. That started this rocket ship of growth. Then we got deregulation in 2017. We got this big tax cut. Now we're seeing going into the trade deals and fighting for American jobs. I mean, this, uh, Van, this uh, economy is a rocket ship. And now we're going to go in and take on That's China, which is really the biggest I, I, economic I, I, competition I, over the next 50 I, years. I mean, this, this is the big thing. I hey, mean, listen, I, listen all, all that sounds great. Very nice story. Here's the reality. The reality is, all the numbers you're talking about were moving in the right direction under Obama, and you guys said that we were in hell. The numbers continue to move in the same direction at a slower pace, and now we're in heaven. That's because you read bedtime stories to your kids and think it's real life. In real life, both presidents deserve more credit than they get. All right. Uh, yeah, Jason Miller, Van Jones. Van, you. Van you, you sound like Jan Brady. <laughs> uh, programming note, don't miss the, uh, the Van Jones Show tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern. Hey, guys, it's Poppy Harlow. Legendary singer-songwriter Jewel joins me as my guest on Boss Files this week. From homeless to a Grammy nominee, as a teenager, she hitchhiked across the country until she was discovered singing at a coffee shop. When I became homeless when I was 16, I came hitchhiking across the country. And that first song I wrote, Whole Save Your Soul, was really about seeing America for the first time and this idea of can we save ourselves. A few years later, she was on the cover of Time magazine and has since been nominated for four Grammys. Hear her incredible story in this week's episode of Boss Files. Well, what a strange day it's likely been for the president. This morning he was uh, touting the, the state of the economy, new numbers out showing it's growing at the fastest pace in four years, up 4.1% in the second quarter. Also this morning, the president was angry, pushing back on all the things related to Michael Cohen, his former fixer. The two are now in an all-out war, as you know, as we've been reporting tonight. It's a tale of two White Houses, a mix of the good and the bad. Here to talk about it, CNN political commentator Van Jones, host of the Van Jones Show. Also, Jason Miller, former advisor to the Trump campaign. Um, Van, I mean, isn't the, the president overdue for some credit for these, these economic numbers? Look, absolutely. I, I, I've said many times uh, Obama got us moving in the right direction. Uh, Trump said we're moving in the wrong direction. He lied. That wasn't true. We're going the right direction. But the liberals said that Trump was going to screw it up. And they were wrong, too. Uh, the Obama numbers have gone in a straight line from the unemployment coming down. Uh, a good pass off to Trump. Both parties should be happy about it. The problem is, even though the economy is coming up, the society is coming apart. And the president is driving that level of division. And I think that's where uh, you know, you've know you got to continue to hold him accountable. Jason, uh, no doubt you would make the argument uh, as well that, that the president isn't getting the credit he deserves on the economy. I'm wondering how much responsibility he bears for that. You know, if every tweet about a witch hunt or a hoax were replaced by a tweet about the economy, wouldn't that wouldn't he be better served by that just in terms of a focused message? Well, absolutely. I think the White House does bear some of the responsibility for some of the messaging that comes out. And it's there. Uh, they obviously do have a big part of the say in what comes uh, what they're talking about each day. And they can either talk about the economy, they can talk about the successes that they're uh, pushing, or they can talk about the distraction. But I think there is this uh, this cloud, I think, that many of the detractors want to have over the White House. I call it, uh, in a sense, the, the Jan Brady syndrome, where uh, Many of the detractors, every time President Trump does anything good, they want to say Russia, Russia, Russia. In fact, I was watching Twitter this morning when the president was having his press conference, and I was shocked, really shocked, 
the number of journalists and even news outlets, folks who I really respect and have a, a great deal of admiration for, while the president is up at the podium talking about the growth numbers, uh, as you talked about, the best GDP numbers we've had in four years, that were just actively hitting the president on Russia and Cohen and Mueller. And the president literally couldn't even get through that press conference with folks hitting him. And again, I'm not saying that the president and the White House are immune from criticism. I'm not saying that they don't have days where they create some of the headaches for themselves. But it shocks me every time I see this where they literally won't let the president get up off the mat. Is part of the problem, though, Jason, they've only had three White House briefings in the last <laughs> month. <laughs> and, 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 you know, this tape has come out and which shows that the president uh, lied and the campaign lied about knowing about the deal with AMI and Karen McDougal. Um, and they've not said anything about it on the record. Well, I think uh, to the point about the press briefings, I mean, uh, the president's very accessible. I said when I was on the other night that I think he's one of the most open presidents that we've ever had in the White House, with uh, whether it be the cabinet meetings or the uh, the different press sprays that he has when he brings folks in. Obviously, the one on Wednesday got a little bit off the rails. Uh, I think that's probably an understatement. Instead right. of talking but you can't say he's uh, open about when they the kick out the whole trade reporter. deal. I mean, yeah, I, 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 just, I mean, yeah, I no, like and, 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 I, and, I, and planets, I, and I, and I, man, how can you say the, the most open? They threw yeah. out one of our colleagues because she did her job and the, the other problem I think that, that we've got to be able to uh, face straight ahead is that when do you have uh, the, uh, openness when you want to have it that's not transparency it's when you're able to stand up and take tough questions and be available and you can't then say look I want to be able to have a happy press conference about my happy topics and I'm going to be upset and throw a fit like a, like a toddler because somebody asked me a hard question that's what we're dealing with I, I do want to say one more thing though I'm surprised though that conservatives are not more upset with what's going on in the economy. I remember when uh, President Obama was in office. Because of deficits, we had the Tea Party marching all across the country. We now have massive deficits under Trump and no complaints at all. The, 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 the conservatives attacked Obama for bailing out the auto industry. Now you have Trump bailing out uh, the American farmers, basically taking farmers and moving them from work to welfare because of his trade war and not a, a, a peep. So yes, there's good economic performance, but it's based on massive deficit spending, which conservatives won't check, and a trade war, which makes no sense, and bailouts, which conservatives won't uh, criticize. So there is something going on in the economy that I'm surprised. You talk about being shocked. I'm shocked I don't hear people like you having more fidelity to your own conservative Jason, principles. What about that? Yeah, uh, Van, I mean, we're looking at unemployment numbers that are a 50-year low. We're seeing a trade deficit that's been reduced by $50 billion over this past quarter. And you and I both know uh, that the federal debt doubled uh, under President Obama, that we because need we real a huge economic recession. growth if we're, ever gonna go, economic if we're ever going to go. But, but again, but we, had the, but we had the slowest growth. We had the yeah. slowest since recovery the last time we had a since financial World crash. Since World War II. Since World War II. You and, and I it was, both it, know it was, that and financial it was the slowest crashes recovery. are hard to come back from. And it yeah. was because as Republican, and, and, and it was it was a, it was a slow recovery. And so, Van, what we needed is to go and jumpstart this economy and go get it moving. And I think that's what President Trump has done. And if we go back to the election of 2016, right after that election, you know as well as I do that every corporate leader in America thought that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And so, and they were essentially thinking there were going to be higher taxes and higher regulation as a result of that. So, when President Trump won, they're almost playing with house money. They started investing in the in their companies, investing back in the economy. That started this rocket ship of growth. Then we got deregulation in 2017. We got this big tax cut. Now we're seeing going into the trade deals and fighting for American jobs. I mean, this, uh, Van, this uh, economy is a rocket ship. And now we're going to go in and take on That's China, nice which is really the biggest I, I, economic I, I, competition <laughs> over the <laughs> next 50 years. I mean, this, this is the yeah. big thing. I mean, hey, listen, I, listen all, all that sounds great. Very nice story. Here's the reality. The reality is all the numbers you're talking about were moving in the right direction under Obama, and you guys said that we were in hell. The numbers continue to move in the same direction at a slower pace, and now we're in heaven. That's because you read bedtime stories to your kids and think it's real life. In real life, both presidents deserve more credit than they get. All right. uh, uh, Jason economy. Miller, Van Jones. Van, you. Van you, you sound like Jan Brady. <laughs> uh, programming note, don't miss the, uh, the Van Jones Show tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Eastern, here on CNN. They'll talk to NBA star uh, Carmelo Anthony. Van also takes on the progressive movement. Also a reminder, join us Monday for our daily interactive newscast on Facebook. You can watch Full Circle weeknights at 6.25 p.m. Eastern. Go to Facebook.com slash Anderson Cooper Full Circle. I'll see you there Monday. And 360 continues tonight. Up next, the shifting explanations about the meeting at Trump Tower, how we got to this point, what the president is saying now about all of this.